The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Participants in this podcast may also own the stocks discussed. For a full list of current recommendations and stocks owned by staff, members of Intelligent Investor can visit www.intelligentinvestor.com.au. Welcome to Stock Tech. My name is Gaurav Sodi. Joining me today is analyst James Carlyle. Hey, James. Hey. And with us also, all the way from Melbourne, is Mickey. G'day, Mickey. Thanks, Gaurav. Mickey, um, and James for that matter, we've got a couple of upgrades or potential upgrades we've been working on over the last couple of weeks. And I believe uh, there's a couple more in the pipeline. So you'll be hearing from a few interesting potential buy ideas. All three stocks we're going to talk about today. Um, I think have been discussed as potential buyers at some stage by the analysts and with varying degrees of success. So we'll kick it off with Infratol, which um, if you're listening to this, you'll be aware that it's already on the buy list. Um, It's a fairly complex business. And I first got a hold of it because I was actually on a panel, a media panel, and someone asked about Infratol and I didn't know it was listed. And um, I went through and had a look at it and I thought, oh, this actually looks quite interesting. And after a couple of weeks, um, I'd done all the work, took it to the Dragon's Den, got rejected the first time, took it back again, and kind of got past the second time. And what I like most about this, so so let, let's bring it back a little bit. Um, gentlemen, did you have you ever heard about of Infra, Infratol before? Were you aware of it before it got uh, mentioned? Well, I've, I've heard the name bandied around, but it's one of those ones that always just looked too complicated, so I never really... Took a look yeah, at I think that was the same for me. I've heard it announced in deals. I knew kind of where it operated in. I knew it was a New Zealand business. Didn't know it was listed. Mickey, did you? Have, I'd, I'd, I'd read about it, um, I think, in, in a fund manager report um, before, uh, and it sounded interesting. So, Yeah, actually, that that's the other way I got interested. You mentioned it to me. It was in, I think, the Cooper's report, and I think you mentioned it. I, I don't me. think I mentioned it to you, but I think uh, maybe we're just reading the same stuff. Maybe we're reading the same stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe someone else mentioned it to me. Um, yeah, and I saw, saw it in there as well, and, and yeah, and we're off and running with it. So it's a New Zealand-based business, and it's a um, it, it's it's hard to define actually. So the business actually takes stakes, large stakes in um, specific infrastructure-style assets, and so they have a whole list of classifications of the type of assets they're looking for. And generally, they want something with um, where you can deploy capital, large licks of capital, and get decent rates of return back, where it has long lives, um, strong cash flow characteristics, and strong returns. So, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, it, yeah it's quite typical of, of infrastructure okay. style investments. And the business actually is an active investor. So it buys and sells stakes. So it's quite hard to pin down a portfolio at a single point in time. And it's can, recently, can I, yeah, sorry, it's can I just interrupt? So, so has that list remained the same since the since the get go, since 19... Uh, 94, oh, no. wasn't it? It's changed quite a bit, actually. So they but, were originally in boring motorways, and now they've sort of gone into this sort of new new age sort of stuff. Is that what's, well? They what's they started that? off in Wellington Airport. Um, Wellington Airport they've held for a long time, and I believe Trust Power they've held for a long time as well. But um, they they used to own some university. Businesses. So more traditional sort of assets. Yeah. Infrastructure. Yeah. And they've recently, only in the last two or three years, have they moved into more. Um, technology infrastructure, so more telecommunications and data centers and renewable energy. They're the three new focuses of the business that weren't there in the past. So the, the company takes large stakes, so 50% plus stakes in these companies. It, it uh, provides capital and advice, often gets um, board representation, and it often brings along co-investors as well. The CEO of Infratrol is actually a board member on New Zealand Super, and so you find New Zealand Super often co-investing with them and he seems to be very well connected because one of their newer deals you had um brookfield who is a canadian giant uh, I, I think it's a terrific business and they've co-invested as well so they they find partners and they co-invest in these assets and then they work on these assets they try and maximize the value from them by selling them or um or, or flipping them or ipoing them at a later stage and they've done that for about um, 16 years no more than 16 years james how long has it been 26, I think. 26 years, sorry, <laughs> yes, 26 years. And in that time, the average return, annual return, has been about 16.5%. So it's been a successful strategy over a long period of time. 
What I like about them today is the portfolio today looks particularly interesting. The largest, most so valuable. Sorry, that, yes. that's six and a half percent. Is that yeah. is that with? Does that include the dividends they've paid? Yes, that's right. Yeah, right. So it's it's NAV or is it share share price plus dividends? It's share price plus dividends. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's still pretty good. Yeah. 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 It's still pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd be not disappointed by that. Well, no, but if it, if you'd had it, dividends on top, that would have been astonishing. Yeah, anyway, that would have been good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the most interesting and valuable part of the portfolio is uh, they own 48% of Canberra data centers. Canberra data centers used to be a small kind of niche data center provider and it's grown into perhaps, and this is an opaque industry, so I'm not entirely sure, but it looks as though it's the largest data center provider in Australia now. It's done that through organic growth and through um, acquisition as well. It's, it's bought one large data center complex in Eastern Creek complex it actually had a small data center attached but a huge piece of land that was well connected with um, fiber connections which is why they bought it in the first place and um, they've been uh, infratil has provided capital um, into growing that business and cdc as it's known now is a data center supplier to government specifically so they house um, and move around government data and that requires a different level of security and uh, and quite uh, quite niche services uh, are required in that sort of environment. So it's quite different to a Nix DC, which is just literally a shell. They're, they're really, it's, that's what's known as a co-location facility. So all they provide is the property and very few services. Um, this is a bit more services heavy uh, in what they provide. So the um, they've now built a network of, of government agencies, um, hyperscale companies, cloud businesses, and supplies to government. And they're all housed and connected inside four CDC data centers that are growing really quickly um, every year. And it looks as though they should be able to double or triple capacity the, over the next five or six years. And that's, I think that's going to lead to an explosion um, in earnings. And we've seen from NextDC and from Macquarie Telecom what can happen when growth gets pulled off successfully in these data center businesses. And I think um, CDC is a good chance of replicating that success. Is that the kind of opportunity here, though? I guess because it, it, you know, it, it it feels like it's a quite a complicated business, and it's quite difficult to get a read on the accounts and things like that. So I wonder, given that complexity, how do you see, um, you know, the share price picking up from here? Is it just that those earnings start to come through? Is it that they make sales in the future? Like, how are you seeing that value kind of start to get realized? I guess over the next five years for shareholders. Yes, yeah, so I think there are two ways. Um, specifically with CDC, that CDC's value gets realized inside the portfolio. At the moment, I, I don't think it is at all. Um, but um, uh, over the next, um, uh, last year, CDC made uh, well, about $80 million in, in operating profit. This year, they should make about $150 million. Um, once the expansion is complete, they should make about $400 million. Um, all that growth will sp- uh, spit off um, dividends, but also come come through in the accounts as um, proportional uh, sort of look through earnings as well. So it will start showing up in the accounts, both in the cash flow as dividends and in the P&L as look through earnings. So you, you get that avenue for growth. But if that doesn't move the dial, then CDC, uh, sorry, Infratil has a history of um, spinning off or, or doing structural change to realize value. And I think there's a good chance of actually them spinning off, IPOing, potentially selling CDC and and realizing the value that way if the market doesn't provide the the suitable multiple for the business. Mm. And they're incentivized to do that as well, I think. They are because they receive quite a chunky management fee. Insiders own $70 million of stock. Um, it's, uh, it's been managed by an external investment bank um, which has close links to Infratel and to New Zealand Super for that matter as well. So it's a bit of a, there's, there's strong incentives to actually make uh, Infratel su- successful. And you can see that from the historic results as well. So how, how much of the uh, CDC revenues does the government contribute? So the, um, so about 85% of revenues is, um, is government directly and um, hyperscale cloud companies um, combined. Um, the government is about, I think it's about uh, 45% of that, so 45% of total revenue. But I would actually include the hyperscale cloud businesses as well because they are in there 
um, for the government and the government's utilizing their services. So I, I would call about 85%. And the, con- and the contracts are how, are how long? I mean, it, it, it's obviously a very, a very powerful customer to have, isn't it? And, yeah. and that's, so that's one big difference between something between them and something like next DC. Look, I, I'd argue that um, having looked at next DC, Equinix, Macquarie Telecom, and now this, um, and even if you look at a couple of overseas data center businesses, globally, the churn rate is tiny. Data centers are really sticky services and businesses only move if A, you really stuff something up as a as a supplier or B, um, the business goes bust. But if you're uh, otherwise... substantially their only customer, then you can, you can tell them what you're prepared to pay, can't you? Um, I mean, well, they, I, I feel as though the government they can't exactly, you know, move data centers that easy. I mean, yeah, the government it, would no. Well, with... that's right. So there's so there's that balance. But with with next DC, people aren't wanting to move, but also they're only a few percent if they do. Whereas, um, you know, the government you could say has, has CDC over a barrel. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so, actually, because the services provided by CDC are quite bespoke to the government as well. So it's not as though the government can just move over to Next DC, who don't actually provide those services. They'd have to wait years. Yeah, they'd probably have to build a whole new thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, I yeah. mean, look, I'm, I'm just trying to look at the negatives. You know? we, probably would have, we probably would have seen that come through already, you know, in like, you know, that would have shown up earlier. I would have thought, you know, if the, if the government was so powerful. Well, did they and, make um, lower margins than the Next DC, for example? Next DC makes super high margins because they don't have any of the cost to serve that um, that any other data center really has. So it's a pure co-location facility, so they don't have service costs. Um, and, and it's actually, data center is a bit different to other businesses where the services uh, don't actually make the high margin that the proper uh, property business makes. Um, in a lot of businesses, the services actually make higher margins. Uh, it's not the case here. So both Macquarie Telecom and CDC, which are more service heavy they actually make lower margins than next dc um, which is why next dc trades at um, significant premiums to anyone else also next dc has as itself incredibly um, high embedded growth as well so i mean we've, we've had a buy on next dc for some time it's been in the portfolios before this is you know this is certainly not to discourage next dc but i just wanted to make it clear that cdc and next dc are quite different style of businesses and so I guess so. It sounds like there's quite quite a lot of the investment case hinges on CDC. Um, is that fair to say? Or? Yeah, I, I think the biggest growth in value will come from the growth in CDC. But there are other really high quality assets in the portfolio as well, and, and we should probably spend just a few minutes um, talking about those. The, the other two assets I think are quite interesting. I are um, they own a 66% stake in Wellington Airport. And obviously, that's been just um, earn, uh, earning nothing over the last um, couple of months. Um, and that, I, I would say, COVID impacts are actually surprisingly common inside the portfolio. Um, Wellington is the best example of that, but there are others, which I think we'll get to in a moment. But Wellington is a, is a quite a unique asset. Um, it connects, it's the main portal to connect the two New Zealand islands together. So 85% of revenues come from domestic traffic. Um, and it hasn't really monetized shopping and parking the way other airports have. It's actually quite a small asset in terms of property. Um, they actually own a lot of property around Wellington Airport as well, and that hasn't been monetized either. So there's there's, there's potential here for lots more growth. Um, but all that is curtailed by the pandemic. Uh, and I think it's actually a really high quality asset that that will need years of investment to reach its potential. Um, it's it, it generates lots of cash flow and like a lot of airports, um, it can handle a bit of debt as well. Um, it actually doesn't carry that much debt at the moment, but, but to fund future growth, you can actually um, leverage that asset up a little bit. So I think there's a recovery coming for, for Wellington, probably much faster than Auckland, given its domestic focus. Um, I don't think that's, again, I don't think, believe that's in the share price. Um, any questions about Wellington, gents, or should we discuss the really contentious asset? <laughs> What's that? Oh, that's Vodafone. That's yeah. Vodafone, yeah. So uh, the other thing I think that might be holding back Infratil's share price is that last year they bought a 49% stake in Vodafone New Zealand. Now, Vodafone Global was trying to sell or IPO 
um, Vodafone NZ for a good five years. Uh, so performance of Vodafone had suffered a little bit and it's still the number one mobile business in New Zealand, but it's been losing market share to Spark, which is the close number two. Um, so there's they they bid with Brookfield, and there's several ways to um, make good returns from this. I think there's no doubt the operation was being poorly run in the past. So there's the typical you know um, cost efficiencies, um, you know focus on uh, the local market by local management, all those operational things which we expect Infratool to do well and has a history of doing well. Um, the CEO of Infratool actually used to be the CFO of Telecom New Zealand for a long time, and uh, Vodafone CEO used to work for him. So those two know each other and know the industry really, really well. So I think there's good local knowledge in place to make a good go of it. But the other thing they've been talking about is trying to monetize Vodafone's mobile assets in interesting ways. They're talking about perhaps establishing a wholesale 5G network in New Zealand, a shared network, um, which would could then potentially be spun off or um, or, into a, or turned into a regulated utility asset. Um, they're talking about maybe doing something and uh, monetizing the towers that they own or the cell locations. They own, own about 15,000 cell locations, all connected with dark fiber. So there's a lot of assets attached to the Vodafone business, and these guys are really good at monetizing assets. Uh, so I think there's optionality there that perhaps um, the market isn't thinking about and that haven't clearly been articulated. So there's nice option value there. One l final um, asset that's worth mentioning is Tilt Renewable. So this is a, a business that's um, spun off from Trust Power, which is New Zealand's version of AGL. Um, they own a huge um, uh, library, not library, what's it called? A huge... Um, oh. Yeah, huge farms. Isn't it a wind farm? Isn't that what we're... Wind farms and solar farms. Wind library. But <laughs> utility scale. So these are really large um, power assets. Um, and they are, su they are actually surprisingly profitable. They get every... Um, about 90% of all the power generated gets contracted out. Um, and they earn operating margins of 70%. So these are quite attractive assets. Um, and Tilk actually sold one of its farms in 2019 for a billion dollars, which kind of shocked everyone. Um, so it shows you how That's much more value. than it's worth. Uh, I think at the time it may have been. Your valuation on, in your article has got it at 850 at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so there's a lot of... Uh, well, I've just taken the market cap. And, oh, I see. Yeah, because yeah, it's listed in New Zealand. So I've just taken the, the, the market cap and the valuation. Yeah. yeah, so there's... I, I guess, look, it, it is a very complex business. There's a lot of moving parts. But the thesis is quite simple. I just think that this is a very strong um, asset manager with high quality assets and lots of ways to win at an undemanding price. And you kind of have to close your eyes a little bit and hang on because the path to value realization is not clear, but we know these are high quality assets and good quality management. And as long as you're not paying a silly price, I think your chances of doing well here are actually quite high. Yeah, I'm, I'm never bothered too much about the path to value realization, as it were. Catalysts is, an, uh, is often a oh, I hate that. way yeah. people talk about it. I mean, you know, I think as long as the value is there, then one way or another, you know, it should end up in the hands of shareholders. So. You prefer to see it realized earlier than later, though, I guess, wouldn't you? I mean, well, the value get... is the value, isn't it? I mean, if it's realized earlier, then it's worth more than if it's realized later. But I mean, that's... Um, that affects the value rather than if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no difference in the value. But I mean, I guess the earlier you can you can get it, the less likely that it, you know, disappears or Burden something. Out. You know, yeah, exactly. I like that the value here is quite um, hidden to some extent. It's not obvious. You really have to dig into the stakes and the businesses to realize uh, how much they're growing, how much they could be worth in the future. And if you just looked at just the numbers, if you this thing does not um, screen very well at all. It looks silly, silly expensive. Um, it looks like it has very variable earnings. And you probably wouldn't be interested in it if you just looked at the numbers. And, and for me, those are all positives. Those are all reasons why this might be mispriced today. I'm just impressed you managed to get it into 20 minutes. <laughs> I know. I was worried that I wanted to get that out of the way first because I was worried it was going to take up uh, uh, too much time and drag on. But yes, let's let's leave Infratool there.
Um, I should disclose that uh, I, I own it. Um, I don't think anyone else does. Not nope. me. Missing out, boys. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to make money. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for our next stock. Oh, yes, the next stock. Uh. All right, James, take it away. This is probably one no one would ever expect to come from Intelligent Investor, but here it is, James. Why not? Someone commented on the article saying that. I don't see why. Oh, wouldn't. that was my first reaction as well when you first yeah. mentioned it. I mean, We're uh, too highbrow, James. We That's are, we the are. Problem. Very <laughs> highbrow. This is, a, this is a, an interesting stock with an interesting technology. Um, I don't can see we, why we, we shouldn't uh, be covering it. Should we mention it, it now? In keeping... uh, Zuno, did we not say his name? Um, so it's this is Zuno Group, which um, is a soap make, company. <laughs> what, soap company? No, it makes um, anti an antimicrobial um, or a disinfectant. I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Um, but the difference with this compared to traditional, so traditionally people use a bleach or an alcohol or various other things, but you spray on and which, they, which work while they're still wet to sort of dehydrate or poison the germs. I'll call them germs because we're talking about bacteria and uh, viruses and funguses and molds and things. Um, what Zuno does is it actually applies, um, it's best applied, I think, via a, a super fine mist, which then just coats all the surfaces in a particular, whatever you want, disinfecting. Um, and then the, the trick here is that it works particularly well after it's dried. So it dries to form a lattice, you can think of, of the molecules as being like sort of long swords with a, you know, with a traditional sort of sword handle. And the end of the handle sort of bonds to the surface and the sticky out bits on the handle sort of bond uh, to each other so that you get this lattice on the surface with the points sticking up. And the neat trick is that these points are slightly positively charged. And as I understand, I wasn't able to quite find out why, but the cell membranes uh, on bacteria and the viral envelopes on enveloped viruses um, have a slight negative charge. And so they're drawn to these points um, and promptly electrocuted and lanced and broken apart and killed. Um, and because it forms this lattice, which uh, lasts, so the lattice lasts, you know, while it's dry. So um, for up to 30 days uh, on a hard surface and for about 24 hours on the skin, uh, because the skin sloughs off after about 24 hours, um, but it means that you can sort of apply it on your hands in the morning and then expect your hands to be protected for the rest of the day instead of having to do it before you get the supermarket trolley and then after you get the supermarket it's trolley. Actually. How, can you just it, it's extraordinary technology, history. isn't it? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was developed uh, initially in the um, early part of the 20th century. They sort of developed these, they're called quaternary ammonium compounds um, because they're based on an ammonia molecule, but with the hydrogens replaced by chains of some sort. And uh, then, I, don't th I think they didn't know what to do with them. Then some Germans worked out in the 1930s, which is a little bit worrying, but I suppose. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Where is this going? They, they, were, they worked out in the 1930s uh, that it was very handy as a disinfectant. Um, but for years, they weren't able to sort of store it very well. It had to be stored, I think, in methanol. Um, when you applied it, it, was, it didn't get applied so that it formed this lattice. So actually, when you use these quats, as they're called, uh, in solution, if you put a cloth in there, if you leave the cloth in your solution for too long, uh, it, it, because of the positive charge of the quats, it absorbs them all. And so then there's none left in the cleaning solution, if you see what I mean. So there, there have been problems with these uh, compounds used in a sort of traditional fashion. Um, and methanol, of course, very poisonous and flammable and not a good thing to be throwing around. So the uses were quite limited. Uh, I think in the 90s, they worked out how to put it in water. And then what Zuno's worked out is how to formulate it so that it um, can be applied in a water-based solution. 
and so that it can be stored with a shelf life of three to five years. So that's so how, really how is their that different, input. James, to just putting it in water? Like I think you said they worked out in the 90s how to put it into water. So how's that different to what Well, I think the problem is that if you don't, you have to put it in so that it doesn't, um, so the tendency of these these molecules is to form a polymer, to, 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 to stick together and form large chains and lattices you know basically um uh, kind of connect up i guess yeah, connect up and so yeah. so which is what you want them to do ultimately on the surface when you've applied them but you don't want them to do it in your solution while they're sitting on the shelf so that's i think the problem uh that they encountered and that's the problem which zuno has solved or um the people who, from whom zuno bought the technology i'm not quite sure how that actually happened in 2009 um uh, when the company was incorporated, it involved scientists, according to the prospective scientists in California and New Zealand. Um, you know, no doubt some very smart people figured it out, and um, and this is the result. And and it is a truly remarkable technology. I think with wide applications, some of which have become pretty obvious in the last six months. Uh, so, United Airlines, for example, last week. Um, said they were using it on their aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK police is using it. London Transport is using it on the underground. Uh, mainline trains in the UK and Germany. Uh, a variety, so particularly transport use as, as um, uh, educational settings, um, aged care, that sort of thing. JC, are um, we only looking at this and thinking it's remarkable tech now because of the pandemic, or was this also regarded as really good question effect. because i was yeah. i was worried i was going to miss um the, the possibly i think long term the most important part which is um the agricultural usages so oh. even last year they were looking at this and testing it um very widely for agricultural use so poultry and pigs particularly so you can spray that so the growing cycle for chickens uh in a um what do they call it a coop um uh, is about typically about 42 days, I think. And so having something which lasts 30 days gets you almost through mm. that growth cycle. Um, and it's hugely effective. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the chickens grow to be bigger. They consume less food while they're growing because they're fighting fewer. In, they don't have to spend energy fighting infections. Um, you can reduce the use of antibiotics, which is That's pretty important, uh, reduces yeah. costs, yeah. but also there's a lot of pressure on the industry to reduce uh, antibiotics because um, you know of the fears of antibiotic resistance and superbugs. Uh, incidentally, that's a good that's another benefit of the technology because the traditional forms of um, disinfectant, you know, you, you risk creating superbugs, uh, which you know mutate because they're you know they're slightly killed, and the ones that weren't um, you know killed. Uh, survive and and reproduce more and all that. Whereas with uh, Zuno's technology, pretty much if one of, if a virus or a bacteria lands on one of these spikes, it's a goner. You know, there's no sort of halfway, um, slightly wounded, able to replicate uh, situation. So, yeah, I guess if you've got this new technology, my fear would be that, you know, remarkable technology today. But I mean, in ten years' time, we'll probably the rate of progress in, in this field might be really quick, or if they get really successful, I guess, you know, there could be copycats. So, yeah, that's, um, that's exactly, that's exactly the concern. So up, up to this point, it seems fantastic. And I was drawn to it as a, you know, got amazing technology, but the problem is that the tech, it's not patented um, because the pat patents only last up to 20 years or so. Um, and that's after the date of, um, of, uh, I think it's the date of applying, is it? Um, so it would have already, they'd have already burnt through a large part of that. Um, and in making the application, you basically have to tell everyone how to make it. Um, so once the patent runs out, everyone's just going to be all over it. So unless you can keep improving the product uh, and issuing new patents, uh, then, which is like, as a company like Cochlear would do, um, then your competitors, as soon as you release it, your competitors are going to be all over it. So they've opted to try to maintain secrets, but I'm just not sure how effectively they can do that because ultimately this is a solution. You know, chemists 
some clever chemists could buy a bottle of it and I reckon pretty yeah. quickly work out what's in it. Mm. And uh, I mean, that's the question. So working out what's in it is one thing. Working out how to manufacture it cheaply is another. But there's a lot of very big chemicals companies in the world employing a lot of very smart chemists. And I don't think it's... Uh, well, I, I think that there's a big risk that if this uh, area... So if they, they, they're the trailblazer, they create a market. But as soon as they create the market, I, I have a, a, a fear that the prize will be snatched from under their noses. Can you just talk to us a bit about how they fared over the pandemic? Are they just beside themselves with demand and they can't keep up? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so sales in the second half of the year, so the six months to June were 36 million, I think. Uh, compared to about one million in the first oh, half wow. of the okay. financial year, uh, and uh, sorry, two million, and then one million in the prior uh, comparable half. Wow. So sales have absolutely exploded. That's partly, though. I mean, they they signed a few deals towards the end of last year, and so those are beginning to come through. But mostly, it's demand from the pandemic. Yeah, and uh, um, so so revenues have gone through the roof, profits have gone through the roof. Um, to the point that they actually made 10 cents of earnings um, in 2020. Wow, did they? So, so the, it's like seven cents last year? Uh, oh, back at the beginning of last year, I think maybe. Yeah. But um, it, 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 it rose pretty sharply in January and February. People were, people were on it. People were, were on the pandemic well before I was anyway. Um, and uh, so it's only on a price earnings ratio of about 20 times. Uh, mm. Those earnings now, of course, those are those earnings aren't really reflective of. Well, funnily enough, I think they probably are because although so it's only half a year's worth of of um, you know the the, the pandemic uh, affected revenues. This year, you probably get twelve months of that, but costs are going to increase greatly as well. Um, costs increased a lot in the second half, um, and uh, so I think probably. My best guess is around a similar sort of level of um, earnings per share um, this year in 2021. So that that's the sort of P you're talking about. Um, but that, that you know that that's the short term valuation. If someone appears with a similar technology, a big chemicals company, bringing all the economies of scale they can bring to the uh, bring to it in five years time and probably a cheaper product um, with a better, you know, uh, a chemicals company with a bigger marketing department for um, it. I think it's going to be difficult for them. Still, I can see why you think this is attractive, but it does kind of look Well, it's remarkable technology, yeah. but remarkable technology doesn't always get you there. That's the you, thing. It has to be protected. Do you reckon, James, that the shift in, you know, obviously there's been a massive surge in, sanitization products do you think that's a permanent shift or do you think you know after the pandemic's over that that disappears well i think it's got to hang around for a little bit hasn't it i think people aren't going to people are going to keep washing their hands for a few years i think that uh, hopefully yeah well and and on public transport i think we've learned from the pandemic how it can reduce flu deaths for example um and uh so so i think yeah um, just think about your own behavior. I, I can't imagine coming back to the house and not sanitizing my hands or going somewhere and not carrying sanitizer with me anymore. I'll be doing that permanently, I think. And I dare say most people will as well. I did it before. <laughs> yeah, you did it before. That's right. Well, only uh, <laughs> if you're going into the city and you want to yeah. eat something with your fingers. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, I think I was pretty blasé uh, before. That's good for your immune system. That's right. Well, it myself. is. You see. Well, actually, and that's another. That's another potential risk with this doc as well. Mm. I think actually, because to to boost up our immune system, you actually need to be getting small doses of little things over time. If you never got any, a, a small dose of anything, mm. then uh, your immune system would not be fully functioning, as I understand it. And so, if we disinfect everything with this mighty Zuno product. Uh, perhaps we'll miss out on all those little doses of things. The margins do worry me a lot. So I'm just looking at the numbers on Cap IQ here, James, and sort of 60% EBITDA margin. That sounds insane for 
What's well, they yeah, I mean, they do charge for the product. You pay about yeah. 250 bucks for a gallon, oh, my I goodness, think. Is that right? um, but, but, you know, relative to the value that it adds compared to bleach, um, you don't have to keep applying it and all that sort of thing. There's a so, very tempting uh, excess creamy margin there for someone to do exactly Yeah, the gross margin is about 74%. Um, yeah. I don't suppose well, Dow yeah. Chemicals send, sells sells much bleach at that gross margin. I mean, and there's been so much gouging on this kind of product as well. I mean, you know, I mean, you'd think that you could charge whatever you wanted at the height of the panic. I mean, mm. people were just yeah, fighting over this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's but it's particularly useful for, for certain applications. You know, the transport where where you don't want to have to apply it too regularly where. People, you know, the, the moment you you sanitise a handle on a tube, uh, you know, an underground train in London, someone's touched it and it's infected again, and so it it has that capacity to keep things, mm. uh, you know, um, germ free for long periods of time. So um, that's more useful than you know, people can wash their hands and all that sort of thing. So I'm not so, so sure it's quite so useful for uh, skin sanitation, but and how does it work in terms of sales, James? Do they sign contracts, or is it just um, one bulk order and then another bulk order? Well, they they've so they're focusing on the um, business to business market, and yeah, they've right. signed a bunch of distribution deals around the world, um, which have minimum targets for the distributors to hit. And if they don't hit them, then they'll go and find a different distributor. Um, but they're selling directly themselves. They've got offices in the US and in the UK, and they sell directly there. So What's a bit the... of both. It's it's quite a it's a, okay. a tangled tangled web, in fact, of, mm. of different deals and things. What's the um, impact for the customers? Do you know, James? For in terms of the costs, because I imagine before this, they'd have to go and send someone around with a towel and a spray bottle and oh, a disinfect sur yeah. surfaces that way. If you can just put something on the surface for 30 days that might save some costs I would yeah i think or... it i think it undoubtedly does i mean that has to be balanced against the extra cost of the product uh, mm. but but saving manpower like that manpower is pretty expensive compared to disinfectant so mm. i think that's right but 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 particularly in in things like uh, poultry farming uh to probably disinfect uh, a chicken is it a coop um you know you need to get the chickens out of there so it really slows you down so um I think it's a shed. Shed, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <There> you <laughs> your coop is in more more the backyard uh, application. <laughs> well, I'm really, it's a great piece of research, James. Uh, you went really down the rabbit hole on this one. I love the fact that you know the life cycle of chickens in <laughs> in doing. Oh well, they just talk. they just lobbed it into their, one of their presentations. <laughs> but um, oh look, it's been really interesting. And yeah. uh, but I think there's I learned a crucial lesson as well, just because. Um, well, was reminded of, uh, you know, just because something's interesting and just because you put a lot of research in, you, you know, it's this um, sunk cost sort of thing. Sometimes when you do a lot of research on something, you, you feel compelled to, uh, in, in, you know, subconsciously to make it a, a, a good investment opportunity because uh, you don't want to waste all that work. But um, it was interesting, so that's fine. Yeah, listening to you talk about it earlier, I thought you... I thought it would actually be put up for a buy, and I was well. I was going to, I was going to, but just it, in the back of my mind, this lack of IP just kept eating away. Hmm. And I originally was thinking I might buy buy some myself, and I began to start thinking actually I'm not sure. Um, and and so this was all, and that was really the source of my concern. And so I think um, it was right. To, yeah, I mean that. So that what are you doing it, with it now? Is it on? Is it receiving ongoing coverage you're just keeping an eye on it no no i think we'll keep an eye on it out right. of interest but you know the concerns are unlikely to go away are they mm. um, yeah is there a price james oh there would be yeah i mean you could uh accept all these risks at a ridiculous price i mean at, at less than um 50 cents you're possibly going to make that back in five years yeah so uh so there's certainly a price but i don't don't suppose we'll see it all right, that's Zuno. I'm, I'm I actually think it's quite interesting. I'm really surprised that I, I liked it <laughs> because I, we have a tendency. Uh, well, certainly I have a tendency when you see a stock running hot and you see lots of um, volume and excitement behind it, and you kind of want to stay away from that sort of thing. It's not really our style. 
but I'm glad you took a closer look at it on this occasion because it does. It does. Yeah, I think sometimes when things are running hot, and we're we're, we're about to get on to another one. Yes, we are. <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> when things are running hot, it's for good reason. And yeah, uh, I think there are very good reasons for that uh, with Zuno, but a, but that big concern over the IP. Well, talking of things running hot, there is no hotter stock in the market, Mickey Mordick, than the Shin one you. Then Infratil, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, what's the name of the stock again? I forgot. That's Afterpay. That's right. It's Afterpay. <laughs> oh, we've got quite a long and sorry history with this business. We actually, when we were worked, uh, JC, when we worked on the small cap fund, you remember we actually had a stake in Afterpay. Well, at, we had TouchCorp, uh, didn't we? And then it became yeah, Afterpay. Afterpay. And so yeah, I think it was, it was under $3 yeah. when we sold it from the small cap portfolio. Well, and we bought it, and that, that was after doubling our money. We were I think so we, pleased with us. We well. almost tripled our money. I think <laughs> yeah, we almost we, tripled our money. It was we, a we fantastic were. investment. Yeah. And uh, we missed out on the potential, well, Lord knows how many bagger. <laughs> and so, but uh, I think th- the, the argument, what we, what we said then was that it, it had fundamentally changed from the TouchCorp uh, investment that we bought, you know, f- to go from there to Afterpay, it had fundamentally changed. And we tried to make a case for holding afterpay, but I think it was just it was too difficult and opaque. We couldn't justify. Yeah, you know, it it had t- turned into a different stock, and we. That's right. Well, at that stage, they the they line. didn't have that much traction in Australia. They were slowly getting traction in online sales. Mm-hmm. They weren't in any retail sales, and they certainly weren't <clears> thinking about the US. So it was a very different business, and I struggled with the just the use case. I just didn't understand why anyone would use this in, over a credit card. It made no sense to me. And to this day, I must say, I don't understand why people use this over a credit card. But Mickey, you wrote a whole article about it. Tell us um, what you uncovered on Afterpay. First of all, tell us why you actually covered this stock in the first place and um, and what you found out. Well, I covered it because everybody was yelling at me to cover it for about <laughs> six months. So I thought I'd better get around to it finally. Uh, it was actually a pretty easy article to write because we've everyone's got so many opinions on it, and so uh, you know, you, you, there's not too much original thought that you can even bring to it. Really, it's just about summarising kind of both sides of the argument and mm. kind of picking a side. Really, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those stocks that's just so divisive that it's just interesting for everybody. So I guess we kind of had to cover it. So, so why do people use it? To answer Goro's question, why do so, people use it instead of a credit card? Well, they they use it a because it's a cash flow management tool. I think there's kind of a misconception that you know, this is for people that don't have money or you know people but who Mickey, credit card. Is, I I use a credit card as a cash flow management tool because I get sixty days where I don't have to make any payments. Yeah, but or then you got to pay a big so the, lump sum. <laughs> I think the so, difference with the credit cards okay, is that right, I see what you're saying. credit cards have had got such a bad reputation yeah. over the past 30, yeah. 40 years, whatever it is, you know, and, and people, millennials, have seen their parents get trapped in credit card debt and paying it off. And it's just, I mean, it's a pretty, for, for most people, for, for someone who's financially savvy, um, which, you know, I would put, you know, yourselves and probably That's all very the generous of you, Mickey. Thank you. <laughs> in that in that bucket, um, but if you're not somebody who's savvy, it can be a real trap. And then they're actually quite dangerous products for people that don't know um, how to control their spending and how to save money. And so, I think just they've developed. So they've been such a terrible, terrible product for that small group of people that don't repay on time they're quite they don't encourage you so credit cards don't really encourage you to pay in fact they definitely don't encourage you to pay on time because they don't want you to but um but afterpay actually does kind of encourage you to to pay on time and yeah uh, what what are the penalties for not paying i mean similar to a a late fee but uh there's not the same impact in terms of your credit score uh and um, so, yeah, so there's not, not the same impact, I guess, and it's just not as big a risk, uh, I think. Uh, and so people don't want to get caught, you know, in a debt spiral, uh, I think. So it was always, I think there was always a market for something to disrupt that. Uh, and then just having this cash flow management tool that people could use. I mean, they just, and they used it, they liked it. I don't, I don't even know if everything is rational about it either. I think it's yeah. just... I actually think that's the key. I think what we missed here was that we're not really in the target demographic and there's an i think all successful products require a degree of irrationality otherwise if it was perfectly rational to do this someone would have done it already right it, it, mm. it's the reason it took off in what 2016 2017 it's because um 
there's there's some sort of emotional um, detachment from credit cards that millennials have that uh, our generation might not quite understand or agree with. But is, is there for a whatever reason that they're not taking? You look at credit card take up rates; they have dramatically fallen, and you break those numbers up by age groups, and younger people just aren't taking credit cards up anymore, and it's hard to really explain that. Is, it, is there a convenience factor here as well? I mean, is it is it just a very convenient way of paying for things online? So a bit like PayPal, you know, whenever yeah. I'm buying something online and it offers PayPal, I just click on that because it's much easier than putting in my credit card details and all that. Um, and so it, does it does it provide that sort of convenience? Yeah. I mean, paying paying with a credit card is pretty convenient too. I. I, I... Well, is it? Have you got to you got to put your number and everything? I, I mean, no, no. I'm always I, reluctant to save my details, my credit card oh, details well, online. That, Whereas well, with, got, with um, PayPal, you save it once. With PayPal or with Afterpay, I'm guessing I, I haven't done this, but I'm guessing you save it once with Afterpay, and then so after you'd that have, you um, just get to use it. You'd have oh, Apple I use Pay. Apple Pay. Yeah, yeah, so I use so, Apple Pay, but yeah, it's so, so similar to that. Thing. Yeah, similar to that, but it's uh, a convenience. I think um, it really is though, just a cash flow management thing. I think that's the main the main driver because i mean there are people you know on really high incomes using afterpay they just like that it spreads it out they don't have these big lumpy costs coming out and it just makes it nice and easy for them on their bank statements what are people buying i mean <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> we buy everything on afterpay now yeah but i mean for it to be that lumpy over four over yeah, sort I know. Of four I, fortnights exactly. i mean my you know things tend to smooth naturally don't they and don't they limit your exposure to like a thousand dollars or something yeah well i mean it starts pretty low and then it kind of builds up so they oh, can quickly kind of weed out the, okay. the non-payers okay. so um, what's the most you can it's a so somebody you know james packer gets after pay uh, account how much can he spend <laughs> does it, does it, does, is there a limit is there an upper limit to, I think uh, there is an upper uh, limit. Yeah, there there is an it's upper limit. It's more than a thousand. I mean, yeah. It, it's yeah, yeah. it's a, it could be a couple of thousand. Um, oh, well, I so think so. Yeah. So to, to come back to your point, point but I think it, it it is basically you know it's a convenience. Um, it's the smoothing of the cash flow. I guess there is there are some users that are doing it because they can't afford to pay for everything up front. But some people also just like the product. They just like Afterpay. They like the brand. They like they just like it. Uh, and and it, it's it's so strange because most places you go, you know, if you go to a retailer, you you figure out you know what what payment options do they offer, and that's kind of how you decide what to use. Afterpay users are deciding on which retailer to use based on who has Afterpay. Um, it's developed this kind of cult following, uh, and if you go on social media, there's entire Facebook groups in the U.S. that are just you know. Um, they just love it. So, and so, so that's a crucial point because um, it's the retailer that basically pays for the yeah. product. It's not you paying interest or, or card fees or anything. It's the retailer, isn't it? So, how does that work? Yeah, well, the retailer is the customer. I mean, so they so they pay after pay anywhere between three and seven percent of the transaction value. So the the customers are really the product. Um, and so Afterpay's job is basically just to aggregate fanatical shoppers and then refer those shoppers to retailers and when you've got a most of the people using the afterpay product these are people that are very um, high intensity shoppers i guess you could call them and so they're very valuable as well and so when you aggregate them and you keep them on your platform and you give them lots of incentives to to stay with you and you make shopping easier uh, and you give them rewards for that um, then that can be really valuable to a retailer because when you re begin to refer customers to th that retailer, uh, that can it, it, it usually results in increased sales, uh, and so Is that that's the case? why you Maybe see retailers finding that afterpay customers are spending more with them. Yeah, and and I mean, it goes to the goes to the extent that you know they put up big signs in the in the front of the shop saying we have afterpay. Yeah, no uh, but know, what, so... but what if I set up a a, a competitor with a similarly catchy name, and I think there are some, but I don't quite know exactly how they work. But um, and I offered to charge the shop only three percent, and I offered um, to give everyone, uh, you know, sixteen weeks credit instead of I think it's eight, isn't it? Um, why why would that product then? Why would they not put put me up in the front of the store on a you know banner? Yeah, I think uh, well. 
That's my concern like, with it, uh, essentially, is that the competition... One answer to that, James, yeah. is that um, there are millions of people who already have their details saved um, with Afterpay, and if they want to use a competitor, they have to go back and join up with yeah. the competitor. Yeah, so it's, uh, there's... there's um, so switching costs are actually quite... I would, I would actually an, there's say an there's inertia, lots of friction. Yeah. banks and stuff, yeah. But I guess if you're a retailer, you know, and you're, you know, keep in mind a lot of the shopping is done online as well. I mean, are you going to have, you know, you're going to have a MasterCard, MasterCard logo, you know, PayPal, Visa, you might have an Afterpay or a Zip. Are you going to have a whole list of 10 others after that as well? I mean, you might, but I mean. I, I don't see why you wouldn't have half a dozen. And that's that. You only need two or three in this space for the for the competition to force the margins oh, yeah, right down. Yeah. So that okay. so that's I'm not saying that that my afterpay disappears because someone comes and takes that, but but if you have two two or three strong competitors, then but subject to what Gaurav says about about inertia, you know, if people aren't moving, but but mm. I mean a lot of afterpay's value is is in the growth, isn't it? It's not in the current user base. Yeah, so the inertia right. argument, yeah. I'm not sure how much that holds. Yeah. I mean, it, what what does hold though is the immense brand appeal. I mean, yeah, I don't I use think that's key. I don't use afterpay, but I see it absolutely everywhere, and I you know I, even I am considering it. I don't quite know what <laughs> good it would do me, but but it seems like everyone's into it, so it's probably. I think that's a key. I think the key to this stock is to not is to stop thinking about it as a financial transactions and payments business and start thinking about, about it like a brand, like a, like a brand business, the way we would do for A2 Milk or something. Um, and when you start doing that, um, then you start being able to justify these very lofty multiples um, and you start being able to infer all the revenue growth. And I actually think the, the history of the company makes sense because the, the place where it's at is actually very unique. The paying customer is the retailer, but the real customer, the person that Afterpay is actually trying to appeal to, is the the consumer. But that's um, that's a bit like um, Westfield, isn't it? That's how I've always understood the Westfield oh, yeah, model. That's, if that's you see what bad. I mean, yep, because the yep. Westfield's job is to supply shoppers to the people who pay it rent. Um, yes. So it's a it's a sort of um, yeah, it, it aggregates uh, shoppers. But I think Afterpay. The one thing that they've done better than anyone else is just build that brand. So, you know, you can even, even from the language people use, no one says, well, um, uh, we'll buy now, pay later. Everyone says, we'll have to pay it. And and that's become the, is it a verb, James? Oh, I think it's definitely a verb. Is that yeah. the doing word? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I didn't know about the grammar. They never <laughs> yeah. taught us grammar no, it in is, school. It is a term. verb. Yeah, that's the doing that's word. A verb. Okay. Any <laughs> noun can be verbed, yeah. they say. <laughs> So I think that's what. Well, you're not going to say it's been zipped or sizzled. I, don't well, know, I think, I think you strange. are. I think. Well, I think you might. As I say, any any noun could be verbed. Yeah. See, so, so, James. <laughs> I actually think James's point is is valid. That the retailer has an incentive to, to provide multiple um, choices, but mm. the the real customer, the the target audience for the product is the consumer, and the brand is actually is what has most value, more value than the. Um, than the contracts or the network. I, I think it's the, the brand equity that's been built up now is so powerful. Um, and, and I think that's what people pay. I think there's some justification for it. Like you look at these growth numbers and users. It's quite astonishing. You can only do that if you have a brand that people will just love and follow. Do, do either of you guys use it? No, I wouldn't. Yeah, because I'm just wondering, yeah. I mean, perhaps the trick is here that you've actually got to use it I for think a it might be to understand yeah. the value because perhaps the, the app... You know, you 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 see all your spend. I'm get, I'm presuming you see all your spending. You see, um, maybe it's just a, a really nice way of of understanding your finances. But I suppose only the only the portion of your finances that you're actually spending in places that accept afterpay, which are, it would only be a small part of it. So, yeah, I don't know. But it, but think... it, no doubt it's it's a fun, nice thing which people enjoy using. We have yeah. actually. I mean. I don't think I was ever interested in Afterpay. I never really considered it for an investment, even when it fell. But one lesson I've learned from the Afterpay saga is that every time you find a product that customers really, really love, um, it's probably worthwhile just having a look, even though the valuation might look ridiculous, um, even though the management might be doing crazy things. Um, I think that Tesla, Tesla there actually. Oh, Breville, Breville is, is another great example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, but Tesla as yeah. well. Tesla just looks. It, it ticks so many boxes for frauds and and short sellers, uh, and yet uh, the product is just beloved 
by Apple, Apple is another. Yeah, Apple, where, is it, where, yeah. where, if if you've got a bunch of really, really um, fervent, you know, users, yeah. customers. Yeah, I mentioned that because I've actually got a stock coming up uh, that 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 satisfies oh. that exact criteria. <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> I will keep it as a mystery stock, but we will discuss it in a few weeks' time when I've actually done finished all the work on it. Uh, uh, Mickey, so you'll listen from from Afterpay. Yeah, well, I think there's a few. I, I I mean, I still think you know the price is baking in just too much success. Uh, you know, a lot of people call it a bubble. I don't think necessarily that it's a bubble. I think it can go on to justify its price if a lot of things go right for it. So I think there are scenarios where you know it still rewards shareholders. But I see that uh, you know the competitive landscape is just too unclear over the long term i think to make that bet uh and so i think at these prices it's it's uh it's too too hard but yeah i've certainly learned a lot you know researching it i mean if you can if you can look for you know businesses as you say with customers that love the product uh you know driving that's driving rapid adoption and it's kind of the first mover um you know it's easy to tear these things down but you know when something like afterpay has this huge addressable market that it can go after it's kind of this you know if you if it wins if it gets there it's going to be worth a lot and if it doesn't well you know if it's a zero so you you're getting you know a lot of upside potential it just depends on your investment style as well and um you know you, if you if you were i don't think you well, some people did take quite a high conviction position on this kind of thing early, and and I guess that just required you to really identify those trends early and get to know the business well, and and then you'd build confidence around it being a really big thing. Uh, so, yeah. The other the other thing is, um, and it's something that you see. Sorry, I mean this is roughly what you're saying, I think, but but you see it with fund managers as well sometimes, um, where uh, where where you've got a business momentum. There's there's often very good under underlying reasons for that momentum, and mm. it, it takes a lot to slow it down, you know. So I think Afterpay's certainly had that momentum, and perhaps we underestimated that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, momentum's great. I mean, if you're especially, you know, it just attracts success as well. I mean, you can, uh, you know, attract better staff. You can hire more people. You can. Uh, you know, pivot into new business lines. I mean, there's a lot of things that Afterpay could still do to to grow its business, not just in buy now, pay later now, but it could use the data to offer other loans. It could, it hasn't even begun kind of monetizing like a marketing platform where it could, you know, begin um, sending offers directly to its users, for mm-hmm. example. Uh, you know, and then there's other verticals as well that it can enter. Like right now, it's pretty hard, um, heavy on on retail, uh, but there's other verticals as well, and it's it's underpenetrated in men. Um, so, yeah, it's it can still go on and and do new things and find new ways to make money over time. So it's and and, it, and I think as an analyst, it's easy to just shoot things down, but you've also got to use your imagination a little bit and try oh, yeah, to imagine so. if 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 you're the owner of this business, how would you try to keep adding value and how what else could you do? Uh, it's hard to value that, but it's it's definitely worth something. Yeah, I completely agree. The other thing is just the, the model itself is a really good one. I mean, you, you take a limited pool of capital and you can recycle that really quickly, turn that around really fast. And that's a great recipe for high returns if you can recycle capital really, really quickly. Um, by lots of transactions, you weed out the, the, the users who don't pay you back or are disingenuous. Um, so that works really well. And then you've got lots of data to work with as well because you're, you're capturing so many transactions. So the, the model is actually quite good. The economic does, model is quite good. Yeah. Does the and retailer get A lot of people there? miss that as well early on. People people miss that and just assume that, you know, there's going to be too many bad debts, too much fraud, yeah. you know, it wasn't yeah. going to make money. And I think now that they've kind of disproven that and shown that you can probably make money doing this. That was but, a big turning point for me was actually the um, – in, in March, when it looked like the world was going to end, um, mm. Afterpay's operating metrics were still pretty good and the bad debts were really low. Um, mm. And that all, I think, went a long way in proving that the model worked in difficult conditions as well as in... When did the data for that come out then? So, because um, so, the share price dropped about $12, didn't it? I think, yeah, yeah it, came out, it came out after that. And that's and so, what, so the, it was already up at 30 jump. bucks. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So you, you, but if, even if you bought it 30 bucks, you still would have been pretty happy. Yeah, well, that. sure. But you would have been, I mean, look, yeah. 
there's a lot of hindsight, isn't there? But, there is um, a lot of hindsight, yeah. But it just, it just yeah. validates the model. I always had concerns about the how it would fare in downturns and but we haven't, you know, that's the the thing with this. Let's go back. Every every conversation now has to get back to COVID. It's one of the rules, isn't it? But the, the, <laughs> the, because we haven't actually had the downturn, have we? That's the thing. It's 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 oh, how they fare once the jobkeeper and well, I mean, but the, and... the, the the thing is that they they can restrict their lending criteria, so the algorithms that decide, you know, who gets how much. Um, credit and so they can really pull back on that when and it's a very short cycle and i think that's Gorav's point so it's so yeah, it, yeah. It, th- th- there's um but it hasn't i wouldn't say that march was a test for it because people people were spending more we were yeah. all buying we need nuclear, some more nuclear we? bombs for that <laughs> <laughs> i take your point james it was a <laughs> test but it probably wasn't the yeah, gut-wrenching yeah. test that, that we might be looking for yeah okay um well, I guess so. I guess to to your point, James, like there was a lot of stimulus coming from government, so maybe we haven't seen consumers come under as much pressure. Yeah, as, no, I think that the, uh, we're definitely so. going to see the, the the worst economic impacts are, are still to come. I think, mm. but um, yeah, that's a fair point. Let's hope it's not too bad. I actually disagree with that. I, from where I sit, I'm actually not as pessimistic. I just don't think governments are going to allow um, the downturn to last all that long. They've got a lot of options still and really i mean I just they can't just keep you can't just keep borrowing from future taxpayers well you, you can well you, well you can <laughs> you probably but shouldn't it's, but you, it's but not you yeah well you, you shouldn't yeah what well, so yeah. yeah, just try well, and stop them james just <laughs> mm, well i yeah. wish i had a way but anyway there we go let's not get into that yeah i also think the um i mean the the other side of this we're, we're probably not recognizing the um the elastic band effect of, of coming out of all this, you know, I mean, there are so many things that I cannot wait to do. Um, and you look at savings data, um, consumer surveys of, of travel, even cruise, I mean, cruise liners are reporting um, pre bookings at record, record levels, which is just mind boggling to me. Well, I think that was the case even in March. People were yes, that's right. It was, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I just think the the the, the spring but, effect is going to be. But um, ultimately, you've had large sections of of the world. Let's talk about the world, not just Australia. Yeah. But you've yeah. had large sections of the world that have been unproductive for months, and yeah. the economy, the government has had to pay them to be so. That's and and so there's a you know there's a a, a permanent cost. In I wonder. I want, I've been thinking, well, I'm sure we've all been thinking about this a lot, but I mean, in terms of what we've really lost, I mean, I'm sure there's quite a lot in terms of real productivity, but, you know, when you think about what you need to survive, you need, you know, house and food and water and all, you know, energy, all of that stuff is kind of continued right going. So a lot of the economy, the rest of the economy is just based around, you know, our wants. And I guess that's kind of what's Well, suffered. yeah, but, but the economy pays for hospitals as well. It pays for healthcare, pays for doctors and nurses. And, mm. you know, long term, we're going to have less money to spend on those things. Um, my, my greatest fear is, is that it uh, um, raises the cost of capital so that long term people have to, you know, starting businesses is more expensive. So it just slows down growth. So on top of the additional debt that we're going to have, we're going to have, uh, you know, it'll be it'll be small and it, and people won't it won't notice. But I think that um, growth for the next probably few decades will be a little bit lower than it would otherwise have been. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not exactly easy to go out and start a small business as it is, is it? So you know, yeah. knowing and then when we... you've got to know that government might lock you down. Um, and and uh, you know that's the that, that that's the other thing is that people I think are tending to treat this as a one in a hundred year event. I think we mm. talked about this on the last podcast, but there's actually been four in the last hundred <laughs> years, so it's actually more like a one in a thirty year event. And um, I know I don't know if this kind of uh, reaction is sustainable um, to do to do uh, that frequently. Look, we we've uh... to pay it. <laughs> I was going to say, we've That's it. strayed from Afterpay a little. Um, I was going to ask you, do any of you guys own Afterpay or ever planned or been tempted to buy it? I've, 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 I've wished I bought it, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I've not, not ever planned to buy it, no. Mickey? I've sort of been in the same camp. I've just never gotten totally comfortable with it and uh, I've just watched it ride straight by. But I, I, I never, never kind of... Um, 
well, I want to say I never doubted it, but I probably did at times. But I, yeah, I don't. I think I think you get in a lot of trouble um, as an investor if you have too many regrets. If you if you yeah, miss things like Afterpay and you yeah. say, "Oh, I wish I bought that," you know, well, there's and then you, things, it, well then your next the next thing that looks almost like an Afterpay, yes. you're going to be wanting to buy that. And no, this is know, exactly where I was the, going. It's the Skinner uh, box effect, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I completely. This, this is um, yeah. So this is like the final point I kind of wanted to to draw upon here that. Um, even if you didn't make money, from, actually, if you didn't make money from this, you've got to be really careful about the psychological impacts in the future. As James says, the temptation then is to always find, try and find the next big thing, could be the next afterpay. So you, you throw some of your discipline away, and that discipline may have led you to throw away afterpay, and it's maybe it's worthwhile learning lessons from that, and we've gone through that a little bit today. But maintaining discipline is, is what also stops you from buying you know, what was what was that uh, biggin or something like that? You know, some, mm. some um, junk company. Yeah, that's right. We, we, you forget about the ones that yeah. uh, that you didn't buy that blew up, and then and we've uh, done perfectly fine without um, without afterpay. So yeah, you know, you can be a you can have good results without buying the hottest stuff. Well, and point. I think when you look at these stocks, there's a temptation always to think, well, afterpay. Let's let's say it's ten bags since the point at which you thought you might buy it. Yeah. Um, and you sort of think, gosh, I was going to put you know twenty grand in that. And if I, it had ten bagged, I'd have made myself two hundred grand. Um, but you never would have, no, because you you'd would. always have sold a bit after it had doubled or trebled, because yeah. because it would have been a much bigger percentage of your portfolio, and it would have been inappropriate to have a a larger weighting in a mm. in a, a, a less undervalued stock at that point. So you know, it, it, when you look back, you sort of forget all those finer points of portfolio management. You just think, oh, I've missed out on making myself a fortune. Um, but it's it's actually harder hanging on um, to a stock that ten bags. Well, it, it, it's it's actually not appropriate because you end up taking too much risk on it at, at, at a reduced at a um, with with less value. Yeah, you can never actually really win. I mean, you're always just questioning why didn't I buy it or why didn't I buy more of it or why didn't I you know <laughs> yeah. or why didn't I sell yeah, it? You can always you make know. better moves. So all yeah. you all you can do is is try to forget about the things you've missed, yeah. the mistakes you've made, and try to make good decisions. That's right. Wonderful. All right, that's a perfect place to leave this episode. Mickey James, thanks for joining me today. Great, thank you. It's been a pleasure. For everyone else, thank you for listening.